Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And I'll try and get through this quickly so everyone can get to lunch, which I think is certainly your, your top priority. <clears throat> um, this is a talk about a sort of laying out the benefits of subsurface storage and also um, looking at, at uh, a benefit that is, is not uh, discussed or perhaps realized too much concerning hydrologic basin closure. <clears throat> and it uh, highlights some recent research. Most of the, a lot of the work that I'll be showing is the work of postdoc Zulin Gao and Rich Palu, who are both in the room, so they can answer all the difficult questions uh, here. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start with uh, the undesirables. Uh, the sigma uh, undesirable effects used to basically define overdraft in California. And uh, these, are, these are well known. Chronic lowering of groundwater levels, unreasonable reduction of groundwater storage. These kind of go together. And that's, that's kind of the chief one, right? That if the water levels are stable, pretty much people think, OK, we're, we're OK. We're doing OK if the water levels are stable. Uh, seawater intrusion, um, degraded water quality, which most people think of as mobilizing plumes, significant unreasonable subsidence, and uh, depletions of interconnected surface water. So those are the, you know, those are the, the, the things that we, we worry about. <clears throat> and um, you could consider these the, the, uh, the knowns, and they're, they're known unknowns to, to the extent that we can uh, evaluate them. <clears throat> and uh, some of them uh, are unknown knowns. But what you worry about more are the unknown unknowns. Just, and, I, and, I don't, and I don't quote Donald Rumsfeld very, very frequently, but in, in this case, uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's somewhat appropriate. <clears throat> so think unknown unknowns. So in terms of these, these top two in particular, you know, what we think of is, so here's change in groundwater storage for the Central Valley split up into the portions. The green is, is the uh, uh, Sacramento Valley right here. So until the drought, you know, it's, it's been stable. So we would characterize that as a, a non-overdraft situation, and we feel, feel like all is well, right? <clears throat> then, of course, the Tulare Lake Basin is the one where there's been a free fall over the last um, you know, 50 to, to 70 years. And uh, that's very clearly a case of, of non-sustainable uh, water level decline or chronic, chronic water level decline. And eventually, the basin will be, be emptied uh, at, at this rate. <clears throat> so just to highlight some of those other aspects of the undesirables, um, the ecological effects as illustrated in, in Claudia Font's map of the, the pre-development uh, land uses, <clears throat> which include a lot of wetlands. The green areas in particular and the blue are, um, are you know, water, water sensitive areas that used to be wet. And the lowering of the water table resulted in you know, one of the biggest ecological transformations uh, in California and certainly any, anywhere in the world. <clears throat> so that's that's one aspect. And this area down here, that, uh, where we have Tulare Lake Basin and so forth, and former wetlands, now looks uh, something like this in, in parts. Uh, the other aspect of the undesirables that um, is really not on the list, but it's, it's connected to falling water levels, is effects on disadvantaged communities. During the California drought, thousands of shallow water supply wells have gone dry and not replaced, resulting in signs like this for donating water and moving water around where people um, in places like East Porterville have been without uh, sources of water. <clears throat> so another aspect here, so those undesirables, they're all very clear justifications for uh, maximizing groundwater storage, uh, which means you know, increasing the recharge of groundwater typically. <clears throat> Another consideration is the fact that groundwater quality in many of our agricultural basins is known to be degrading. Um, and that's as long as most of the recharge comes from irrigation, um, it's, it's likely that the groundwater quality will be degrading. And you see it in data. There's historic nitrate data trends. This is from Thomas Harder going back the, the last uh, half century, uh, increasing nitrate trends. There's um, also evidence that there are beneficial effects of clean recharge. 
So here's the key thing. The groundwater quality in general is kind of going to hell. Um, and maybe somewhat irreversibly. <clears throat> and there are things we can do to cut down on the sources, but it's questionable whether we can eliminate trends like this unless we add other sources of recharge that are clean. And evidence that that can help are shown in this little map from the Fresno area. And uh, this is nitrate uh, concentrations. And uh, you see a halo of low nitrate concentrations around a recharge basin called Yes, leaky acres. And uh, along the river here, where the river is losing, and there's lots of other data that illustrates this, actually better than this figure, there's also evidence that recharge from the river is benefiting the, the nitrate concentration. So the basic concept is if you um, store more water underground by recharging more clean water, uh, that may be the only hope you have for stabilizing uh, the groundwater quality over time. So that's, that's another benefit. And here, oh, this is really washed out. But um, this is a figure from uh, USGS uh, decadal data, which is an online um, resource uh, tool. And this, this is a map of their decadal trends on changes in total dissolved solids for groundwater 1988 to 2001, or between these, these two periods. And uh, all across the country, there are these interesting um, increases in, in TDS, significant increases in total dissolved solids. So what's that about? <clears throat> then there's the, so that was kind of the water quality justification. Then there's the climate change justification for storage of water. And as a lot of people know, because of warming, the California snowpack, which is shown here, is diminishing and projected to diminish much, much more. And what does that do? Well, it's already resulted in, for the largest river in the state, for example, a reduction in the snowmelt period of runoff, which is April to July runoff, <clears throat> that is significant over the last century, especially the last 50 years. So why is that happening? It's not happening because of less rain or snow. It's less snow. But uh, basically, uh, the precipitation has been the same or increasing over this time. And why is this happening? It's happening because the snow is melting sooner. And that snow cannot be captured. So the climate change justification in this kind of system, a Mediterranean climate, <clears throat> for storing more water in groundwater is that it gets harder and harder to store the water in surface water reservoirs. <clears throat> and then it's going to get worse and worse. So you look for another place to store the water, and a, a likely place is groundwater. And fortunately, in the Central Valley, um, there's a lot of, of storage space. There's 140 reservoirs that can store 42 million acre feet, but in the Central Valley subsurface, there's room for another 140 million acre feet. Do you want a place to put water? Well, there it is. <clears throat> now, there's, there's issues of how to get it there, and we had a workshop on Monday that, that covered a lot of those issues, actually. So there's, there's room, there's need, and there's benefits of water quality, climate, water security and stability. Um, and then there's this, this potential, what, what, what I might regard as an unknown unknown, <clears throat> the unaddressed consequences of hydrologic basin closure. And the basic way to look at this is, and here's a schematic of the San Joaquin groundwater system, <clears throat> pre-development and post-development. Uh, Pre-development, the, the potentiometric surface is here in some areas above land surface. It's not the water table, remember. It's potentiometric surface. <clears throat> so the system is discharging to the river. And uh, it's an open hydrologic system. Water gets in, water gets out. Salts get in, salts get out. <clears throat> in post-development, the water table and groundwater levels were, were dropped such that now they're below the stream the stream is losing, you're irrigating, pumping groundwater, applying it to the land. <clears throat> what you have here, and no one's really called it this yet, is a, is a closed hydrologic basin. In a closed hydrologic basin, the main exit for the water is evaporation, which um, when you think about it is a little bit ominous. You know, what, what's a closed hydrologic basin look like? <clears throat> Well, it looks like that. Mono Lake, the salinity of Mono Lake is 81,000 milligrams per liter. 
Why? And, and it's not an overdraft. Moto Lake is not an overdraft. The water levels are, are stable, pretty much. They, they go up and down in response to Los Angeles' water diversions and drought, primarily. But we wouldn't call this an overdraft. It's, you know, why is it salty? It's not because of imported salt. It's because of the internal basin sources of salt over, over time accumulating. Another example, Death Valley, the salt flats in Death Valley. Um, a playa, the largest playa in the world in Bolivia, that's a closed hydrologic basin. Yes, salt accumulate in those. The salt and sea, it's a little more than 100 years old, and uh, it's already up to uh, 44,000 ppm and increasing. That's in why, that's, that's a closed hydrologic basin. <clears throat> So the basic idea here is if you have a basin here where you've got a stream, you've got groundwater that's shallow enough that the groundwater spills into the stream, it's, it's an open basin. And by developing the groundwater in a certain way without paying attention to this, just by pumping um, and not even overdrafting in the classical definition of overdraft, we can turn this into a a closed hydrologic basin. In other words, by pumping down the groundwater levels and uh, pumping water from wells, reapplying to the land such that the main exit for the water is evaporation, we've got a closed hydrologic basin. <clears throat> so the kind of the insidious thing about this is it doesn't fit those normal categories of, of what we, we think of as overdraft. We tend to think, if, again, if water levels are stable, and in this condition, the water levels could be stable and not going down year after year, we might think, well, then we're, we're probably okay. <clears throat> but we may have set in motion this long-term process of accumulation of, of salts. And what people, I think, are forgetting in many cases, when groundwater moves into these sediments, you get rock water interactions that are themselves a source of salt. So you don't need to import any salt. Um, to make these basins salinate. The, the source of salt inside the basins just through groundwater circulation and the basic geochemistry is enough to generate lots and lots of total dissolved solids. And here's just an example of kind of the normal rock water interactions um, in, a, in a sedimentary basin. I don't have time to go through it. But, you know, in, in a place like the Talari Lake Basin, these result in the, the total dissolved solids may be changing from 200 or 400 near the water table to uh, thousands uh, at, at depth. <clears throat> um, and typically in the Tulare Lake Basin, the increase in total dissolved solids is probably about 200 parts per million per 250 feet of depth. And again, that's not just the water mixing with salty stuff that's there. That's the rock water interaction. So every time the water makes a circuit through that basin, it's these things are going to happen, and the water picks up dissolved solids. <clears throat> so um, we're just starting this work, really. I'm going to show you some preliminary results, but we are taking a look at the Tilari Lake Basin because, you know, it's very clearly um, hydraulically now a closed basin. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is, not, again, this is not showing up very well, so I'll just move on. And uh, we're looking at the water budgets of the basin. Yes, in this, this basin, the, um, the, the, the change in storage is in a approximately one and a half million acre feet deficit. So we look at the groundwater fluxes based on the available models for now, and uh, the, the, the salt load from those, those fluxes. And basically just do a salt balance of this, this system. <clears throat> we built some simple models um, and right now, like, it's, it's basically the early stages of the research. To do this properly, we have to upscale the transport equations in a way that hasn't really been done. Our ability to model regional scale changes in water quality are still a, a research realm. <clears throat> and it's, the research is going fast, and uh, it's going to be happening in a big way here in the next, next two years in our research program. But we've done some simple models that show um, the, the change in salinity just based on some basic assumptions at 20 years, the blue line, 50 years, 100 years, 200, 500, 1,000. <clears> and this line here is approximately the baseline water quality in terms of TDS 
in the Tulare Lake Basin. So already the ambient water quality does have this trend of, of increasing TDS with depth. Basically what the, the simple modeling indicates that on about a, a century time scale, yes, um, there's significant increase in TDS to the extent that the, the usability of the water would, would be affected. <clears throat> And you say, well, oh, okay, well, we'll just be desalinating. And that's uh, possibly that's, that's what we'll be doing, and we'll be paying for that. And the cost will come out in the food supply. My worry is more um, disadvantaged uh, communities in parts of the world where, which don't have the wealth. Uh, because this, this kind of thing, wherever groundwater is being produced and there's irrigation going on, uh, I would wager there's, there's a high incidents of closed hydrologic basins that are being closed just because of the hydraulics of the basin. <clears throat> so you're setting up a salinization cycle. Many of the basins are smaller than the Tulare Lake Basin, so the time scales of the salinization could be much, much faster. <clears throat> so we've got our green revolution for food that was based on development of industrial fertilizer and irrigation. Much of that irrigation dependent on groundwater um, as we've, we've seen, the groundwater quantity is not being managed very carefully. So it's, it's uh, of concern to me that in many of these basins, we likely have ongoing salinization, uh, essentially an unknown unknown. <clears throat> it's not something that's on people's radar, and it could be one of these insidious things that results in the irrigation water being unusable for irrigation without major investment in treatment that not everyone will be able to do. <clears throat> this is, these numbers are, I think, conservative in that at the top, we already know that our tile drains are producing water of three to 4,000 parts per million commonly. Um, we don't have concentrations that high at the top in this model, so that's, you know, in that respect, it's probably conservative. There's no recirculation, right? Because some of the water here is gonna be pumped back out and reapplied. So there's an effect, a, a compounding effect of repumping and recirculation of the water. That's not in the model yet. <clears throat> and there's no heterogeneity and preferential flow. We know that the transport will happen in certain zones at a much higher rate. <clears throat> and so the, the impacts uh, can be locally much more intense than what you see here. These are just basically basin averages. So in, in some respects, I think this is, this is uh, conservative. <clears throat> and again, uh, you know, this, this can be happening uh, even in a basin where the groundwater levels are flat. The time scale of, you know, centuries, or, um, you know, if you want to go all the way to millennia, you can say millennia, uh, you might say, well, that's a long time. But if you take a look at this rate of um, chronic water level loss, the time frame at which the, the water in that basin would be gone is a centuries time scale. So a chronic water level loss that we regard as bad because you might empty the basin and cause lots of other nasty effects along the way, it's, it's a similar time scale to this salinization process, at least from our, our preliminary calculations. So it's not so slow that you can say, oh, I'm, I'm gonna gamble on you know, infinitely cheap energy and treatment technologies that will save us from this problem. In the, in the future. And regarding the internal salt loading, just from the rock water interactions, <clears throat> and this is not millions of tons, this is uh, annual uh, tons per acre, uh, the, the annual salt loading uh, from the, you know, the, the imported salt is about three tons per acre. The annual salt loading um, from that plus the baseline total dissolved solids, that means the rock water interactions due to the geochemistry inside the aquifer with no importation, basically, um, is you know, another 27 tons per acre per year. So that, that internal source of salt is, is significant and, it, and currently it's not being considered in people's salt, salt budgets. So I, I'm suggesting a reimagining of water storage, I guess. Um, you know, so how do you prevent this? You prevent it by filling up the groundwater basin to the point that it overflows. If the basin overflows, um, you've got water constantly going out as base flow in the stream, and there's a constant trickle of salt, which um, will result in, 
in many uh, uh, tens of tons of salt per year leaving the basin, which is why the basin was fresh in the first place. So the only way, as I see it, to arrest the accumulation of salt is to fill up the basin enough so that you get base flow. And that may sound like it's crazy, <clears throat> um, but let's, let's step back a minute. You know, where is most of the water stored now? Where does nature store fresh water? 95% of all fresh water in, uh, on Earth is in groundwater. <clears throat> Another 5% in lakes and, and uh, surface water and rivers. Okay, so nature stores most of its water in, in groundwater, 95%. <clears throat> um, and uh, so you wonder, well, well why, do we, why do we prefer dams? How did, how did it happen that we decided not to use the groundwater storage as a reservoir concept and that we really, we really emphasized the, the use of dams? And it occurred to me um, you know, that the reason surface storage is the norm is, well, we've done it that way for centuries. And it's obvious, you know, that there's a river there, you put in a berm, you put in a dam, or you put in a bigger dam, and you, you, get, you get water. <clears throat> That knowledge of how to store water, though, evolved before we knew much about groundwater. Modern groundwater technology and science is only about 60 years old. So as our sort of intuitive way of storing water was developing, um, groundwater was thought of as a magical, mystical thing. So our, our capacity to really harness it, control it, and use it as a reservoir was not there. And further, the technology to operate aquifer systems like reservoirs is even younger. It's only really in the last 20 or 30 years that we have the measurement technology, the modeling technology, the computing power um, to really operate a groundwater system like a reservoir. It's possible to do this now. <laughs> so my suggestion is, well, that the knowledge and the technology is just recent. <clears throat> But had this knowledge and technology been around 400 years ago, then uh, we might have seen uh, uh, more benefit to you know, storing more water underground instead of really emphasizing so strongly uh, storage in, in surface reservoirs. So I'm, I'm suggesting um, kind of an upside down approach to storage. So problems addressed by maximizing recharge and storage. Greater total water stored greater water security, less overdraft, mitigation of effects of overdraft, disadvantaged communities, mitigation of effects of overdraft on groundwater dependent ecosystems, potential stabilization of declining groundwater quality from already known uh, non-point sources, stabilization, stabilization of groundwater quality due to intra-basin salt concentration and redistribution from the rocks to the water because of a closed hydrologic basin and concepts that I think sort of challenge the status quo in this, elimination of what we think of as overdraft does not necessarily secure the groundwater supply if the basin is closed and most of the water exits by ET. So we need to factor in the groundwater quantity management and the basin quantity budget and its effects on the overall quality or salt budget. <clears throat> A groundwater basin can be declared an overdraft, this is another way of stating it, by current definitions, yet not be sustainable if it's closed. A significant unaccounted for factor in the salt problem is the internal sources of salt from the rock water interactions, which always occur. Perhaps our long lived concept of emphasizing surface storage is upside down, sort of maybe back to nature as a way to think of it, with emphasis on greater subsurface storage. And yes, you may think I'm crazy. I might suggest less surface storage. In other words, uh, when you have plenty of water in the surface reservoir, it might make sense, if you look at it this way, to um, put a lot more in the groundwater system. <clears throat> so possibly the, the idea of drawing down the surface reservoirs specifically to build up the groundwater reservoirs might be considered heresy, but in this context, it, it might not seem so unreasonable. <clears throat> Hydrologic basin closure, closure and irrigated basins may be the Achilles heel of the Green Revolution. So if we are, and I think we are, slowly salinating many of our agricultural basins because of this, 
it calls into question, it's yet another one of those things, but to me it's, it's really the only one that scares me. The water imbalance, the groundwater overdraft declining water levels, that can be changed. It's mainly a human behavior change. This, I'm not sure how we get these basins to be operated all over the world for agriculture in a way that, that stops a gradual salinization process like that. It's really the only problem that scares me. <clears throat> or uh, we can just resolve, and it'd be nice to know this ahead of time, that use of all groundwater from such basins will become much more expensive in the future because of energy costs of, of treatment. <clears throat> and you know, that's, that's a way to go, but it's, I think it'd be nice to know that that's where we're going. Thank you so much. It is lunchtime, but if anyone has questions. I'm sorry, there's no time for questions. No time for questions. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> well, well from, from Keith now. But Keith, Keith had his hand up, so. As you know, from your participation in uh, Swansea and Drainage, um, there's other ways to move salts out of a closed basin. I mean, I'm not recommending the massive drain problem, but there was on the books a physical engineering solution uh, to move salts as, you know, from as far south as Kern County. Mm -hmm. And there's new plans since then, and we can be moved over the coastal mm -hmm. range. So before you advocate a, um, a specific solution to salinization, I think you're also obligated to consider other you know, physical engineering uh, solutions mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, and I, you're referring to the, the formerly planned main drain for taking drainage waters. And yes, that's important, but that will only work for the parts of the basin where the water table is already shallow. These places where the, the groundwater levels are too deep for there to be drain discharges to something like the main drain, um, you don't have the opportunity to use that technology to, to route the, the salt out. Now, if you, if you build the water table back up enough, you, maybe you would need some more drains, to, and, and that concept would work. Oh, yeah, and, and that aspect is, I, I regard as a good thing from the perspective of the groundwater quality sustainability. Let's keep it moving. Yeah, thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation. We came up to a similar point in the, in the Netherlands, not because of irrigation, but of uh, saltwater intrusion. So owners started desalinating water indeed. Mm -hmm. And then you have to get rid of the, the re removed salts. And that was actually the biggest problem. It's not a difficulty to, to treat the water mm -hmm. and how to get rid of it. If they would massively uh, discharge it uh, or dispose it uh, to the, the river waters, we would have a big problem. Mm -hmm. They came up with a very uh, good market solution, just to bring it back into the aquifer, but a bit deeper. So now we have an even bigger buildup of, uh, of salt water there. So our next step will also be to, to move on to a mass balance and not to a volume balance. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, you have to try to prevent uh, coming into this situation here. Mm -hmm. Treatment alone will not solve uh, the yeah. problem. Yeah, and one of our purposes, sorry, of developing these models is to be able to, to uh, run scenarios in which, you know, we, we add a lot more clean recharge and we bring the water table up and we get some base flow and, and what, what is enough to, to rebalance the salt load in the basin so that there's, there's avoidance uh, in the coming decades of, of a, a TDS creeping up. Hey, um, Tim Bailey. Tulare County Resources Management Agency, your presentation is pretty much my life, and I need to get your card uh, when this is over. But I, what I'm seeing right now, this has been discussed intermittently over the course of uh, the last three days, is uh, the plans that I'm seeing right now in the face of massive population growth here in California is taking people off of the coast and other areas and putting them into the Imperial uh, Valley and up here in the, in the San Joaquin Valley and Sacramento Valley. And so if, if what you're, you're showing is correct, and it certainly looks correct and is consistent with an understanding I have of hydrological processes in the SJV, um, I would ask you to move this information up to Sacramento and start getting a plan in place because if we're going to have this kind of aquifer filling up and overflow and a natural movement 
hopefully of salts out of the area and selenium and the other problems that we have, um, we're going to have to really talk about future construction. If we lose agriculture due to prolonged uh, climate change or drought, I know the next plan is to, is to urbanize, is to see those lands get put into human population centers. The current number is approximately seven Fresno-sized cities by the year 2050. And we can't breathe the air right now that we have. I don't know what it looks like if there's seven more Fresnos in there. So if there's a way that we can preserve these lands, preserve the hydrology, allow for an overflow, and a filling up these aquifers, it sounds great to me. So I would just encourage you to develop this further and to, and to create a discussion at the state level because um, we need help down there. That is my take, so thank you very much. Thank you, and um, for Talari, I think to, I don't foresee that being filled up because it's so far down. So for that one, it may be in terms of the, the groundwater quality on a century time scale, it may just be a wasting asset and uh, water treatment may be inevitable. Um, but for parts of the San Joaquin, uh, even Sacramento County, I see closed sub-basins in Sacramento County where uh, there's no place for the water to go but up. And uh, so in, in systems like that, it may be that um, smaller corrections could be done if we just know what to do to you know, bring the salt balance. And that USGS map and all the increasing TDS across the country, kind of surprising. I think we need to look at, well, how much of that is because of this sort of thing? So we know there's a great lunch waiting for us. Thanks for hanging in there. Thank you. Um, looks like people are just about ready to go. So um, Paul had one last question. If you stick around for it, totally your call. Just a comment, interesting concepts and, and thought-provoking, but maybe perhaps one other mistake we've allowed to occur is we've got people uh, settling in floodplains, and so a lot of these dams on the Sierras were put in place in large part to prevent flooding of where people settled. So another major concern to be thinking about. Yeah, certainly. Good point.